Backing up devices is something I have struggled with forever. I initially used Veeam, which was great, but required me to individually set up each client, and I didn't have a way to centrally manage them. Years later, I switched to Synology's Active Backup for Business, and while it's still a great backup tool, I've always used self-hosted open source applications if I could. So when I started to look into alternatives, I came across your backup, which at first glance seems like it has an outdated user interface and is bare bones, but it's not. I mean, the user interface leaves a little to be desired, but this thing has been absolutely rock solid for well over a month at this point, and it does exactly what I need. I can take file and image backups, navigate those backups to download a file or view prior versions of that file. And the backup images allow me to do bare metal restores if I ever had to. So what's the catch? It only works for Windows and Linux right now, unless you're willing to use a beta macOS client, which truthfully I would not recommend that you do, especially for something important like backups. But other than that, there's really not that many. And in fact, I waited this long to make sure I didn't run into any problems because backup tools can kind of be hit or miss. So in this tutorial, we're gonna look at how to set up the Your Backup server, then look at configuring clients, restoring your data, and some miscellaneous things that I've come across as I've been using the system. So the first thing you're gonna to have to do is set up the Your Backup server. And they have a few different options here, and I'll show you what I used, but also show you how you can set it up. Now. First things first, I would recommend that you set this up on some sort of a NAS device. It doesn't have to be a NAS, but it does have to be a server with dedicated storage. In my opinion, that is the best way to set this up. But what you can see here is there are dedicated installers for specific operating systems. And if you wanted to use any of these operating systems, you can click on this, follow the instructions, and then just install it. However, for most people, I'd say you're probably gonna to wanna to use Docker. So this is gonna be the default Docker Compose file that you can use, and I wanna quickly talk through this. So the PUID and the PGID, this is gonna be who owns the files, but more importantly, this is gonna be a user that has access to whatever share, whatever folder, whatever data set, wherever you're storing the data, that has access to that location so that you can go in and write files to that location. So in specific, it's going to be in the Docker Compose file, this path right here. So the backups are going to be mounted to a local folder on your device. And then at that point, wherever that data is stored, this specific user has to have access to that. So that's the very first thing. Next thing would be that if you're using ZFS data sets and you want to define them with environment variables, you can use this. However, I'm gonna show you how I'm using TrueNAS in a minute and I did not use this. Next, these are just gonna be your volume mounts. These are the required ones. You can also uncomment this line if you want to mount the www folder, you don't have to. And then for the most part, everything else can stay as default. So outside of pretty unique situations, like if you're using BTRFS, you're gonna to have to uncomment these. If you are using the ZFS settings up here, you have to uncomment this line right here. But overall, the important point here is that you need to make sure that your backups are going to a location that is gonna have enough storage space. And that's why I'm kind of recommending an ass. Now Docker makes this super flexible because you can install this just about anywhere. So this is an example setup I have on a Synology NAS just to kind of show you how this works. Since it's Docker, this will work on anything. But overall, the only thing I really did is modified the PUID and PGID. Then I mapped it to the correct directories. And then since this is a BTRFS volume, I went in and I just uncommented those two lines. So at this point I can proceed and then this should create my container. And then after the installation is complete, I can access the IP address and the port 55414. And at that point, that was as simple as it is to set up your backup on a Synology NAS. But if you are somebody using something like TrueNAS, you can go in and you can search for your backup and there is a app that you can install. And that's exactly what I did. I'll just install another instance to show you. But in essence, all I did is inside of my backups directory, I created two nested data sets. And this is gonna be for my backups. This is where my backups are stored and this is where the database is stored. So you can set this up any way you'd like. So we will quickly access the web UI here 
Now, I already set up a password. You would not have this by default, but what I would recommend is that you do. So the very first thing that you should do is go into the settings. You should go to users and you should create a user account. This will ensure that every time you access this web interface, you have to supply a password. It's the very first thing you should do. However, as soon as you do that, there's a few things that we could look at. So if we come back to this status section here, the easiest way that I found to do this is to add new clients, and then we can configure an automated installer for those clients. So this is a Windows 11 virtual machine, and we are gonna quickly configure this. So we're gonna add a new client, and after we do that, we are going to name the client, and then we're gonna add the client. And what you'll see here is that this is where you can go through and install the backup tool. So we're gonna download a pre-configured client installer for Windows. And as soon as you do that, it will start to download. Now, one of the things you're going to run into is that it does not trust this. Windows does not trust this at all. So you gotta click through a few different ways here and then eventually launch it. But after you do that, you can now walk through the installer. So we're gonna walk through this. We're gonna agree to the terms. We are going to install it. And then once you finish that, you have a few different options here. So generally these are gonna be default for most people. You probably wanna use the default options here. However, you can manually specify volumes if you only wanted to back up an individual drive. Overall though, these are really the only settings you have to modify. So if you click finish here and then you go back to the status, what you'll see is that we have now our new client. And if we give it a second, it's going to come online. And now that it's online, what you can see is that it immediately started to back up the system. So that's as simple as it is to add a new client for Windows. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna switch over to Linux as this backup is running. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna add a new client and this is gonna be for a Linux device. So I'm gonna add the client, I'm gonna give it a name, and then we are going to install it directly via the terminal. You can also download a pre-configured client installer if you have a GUI, I'm doing it on Ubuntu server. But you could see the different options here. So you could do it using Docker. There's a few different ways to do this, but for me, the easiest way I found is by installing it with the terminal. So what I did is I SSH'd into my Ubuntu server and then we are going to run that command. And what you'll see is we have our authentication key. We have exactly where it should connect to. For the most part, everything is defined exactly as it should be. So we have to type in our password and then it will ask to install. We will click yes. And now the only thing you have to determine is the exact snapshot mechanism. And for Linux, it's gonna be slightly different but for me, I'm using LVM, so that's what I'll be using here. You don't have to use a snapshot mechanism, which is number five here, but it could get a little messy because it can't technically freeze the file at that point. So I would recommend using snapshots. You just have to determine based on whatever system you're using, which makes the most sense for you. So we are gonna do that. And then what you'll see is it is done. So this client device has technically been set up, but there is one limitation with the Linux client that we quickly have to fix. So inside of this settings.config file, we have to edit it. So as soon as you edit it, you're gonna see that this internet server is blank. We have to add the IP address of the server. So that's our year backup server, the port, everything else is good. For whatever reason, it doesn't write that information when you use the pre-configured installer. If you use any of their other installers, it walks you through the process, I believe but that's the only thing that we have to do. And as soon as we do that, I'd recommend you reboot the system. Okay, so now that it is online, you can see this is our system, it's online. The final thing that we have to do is go into the settings and then for that individual client, we have to set up a default directory to back up. So I'm just gonna back up everything. And as soon as we give it a path, we can save. And then if we go back to the main tab here, we can kick off a full file backup. It's gonna queue the backup, and in a second here, you're gonna see it's gonna to start to index it, and then it's gonna to start to back it up. And there you go, so we are now indexing. So while this is going, next thing would be, again, there is a beta macOS client. I would not recommend that you use it. I'd recommend if you're a macOS user, just use Time Machine. Unless you have a bunch of devices, then you might wanna look into another option. But if that package is ever released officially, I will definitely check it out. At that point, I think it's easier to recommend. But for now, this is our backups. Now let's talk through how you could 
view some of these backups. So the easiest way to do this is to go up to the backups tab and we're just gonna navigate through this VM Docker backup. But you can click into the backup version and now if you had multiple incremental or even full file backups, this list would be full. It would kind of look more like this list here. So that's how it would look if you had multiple backups. But inside of it, you can click into one and then you can go through and start to navigate it. So if we go to my home directory, what you'll see is that these are all of my files. So for Linux, it's a little different. So inside of the individual folders, you can download the folder as a zip file, but inside of Windows, you can click individual folders and then you can restore them directly to the client. So slightly different functionality but that's exactly how that works. And then at that point, you can go through the actual list of files. If you had multiple backups, you'd be able to see every single version of that file. So that's how you would do it. You would, in essence, navigate to the file and either restore it directly, or you would download it and then you can restore it that way. So what we just talked about is file level backups. So now let's talk about image backups. Now, image backups for Linux are gonna be very different. It's a lot more complicated than with Windows. And it's because it takes everything into consideration. So the snapshot type you selected, the file systems that you're currently using, finding the exact root partition. Overall, it's drastically different than it is with Windows. Windows, for the most part, is the same on every single device. So right out of the box, Windows image backups work. For Linux, you can get it working, but it's going to be slightly different. So with this image backup, what can you do with it? Well, you can restore the entire operating system. So you can do a bare metal restore. The way that you would do that is by downloading this bootable restore USB disk. So what we're gonna do is we are gonna set this up inside of Proxmox so you could see exactly how it works. But if this was a physical device, you would download this, flash it to a USB stick, and then you would boot off of that. So inside of here, I'm going to select that your backup restore ISO that I downloaded. And then after it's created, you can start it up. And if we access the shell for this, what you'll see is that we are brought to the restore utility. So we're gonna start a your backup restore. We are gonna use the graphical interface and then we are just gonna run through this. So I selected the network and the time zone and now it's gonna search for my your backup server. Okay, so it found my server. It basically just popped right to this section here. And if I enter my username and password that I defined, you will see that we're brought to the restore tab. So we are gonna select our client, which is this one. We're gonna select an image. I'll do this one is the latest. And then we're gonna select the disk. There are advanced options. We're not gonna use those right now. We're gonna review this. And then we are gonna start the restore process. So at this point, it's gonna run through and it's gonna be doing a bare metal restore. Now, this isn't the best example because this is a virtual machine. So I'm backing up a virtual machine to your backup and then I'm restoring that virtual machine. Realistically, I would just use like Proxmox backup server, which I did a video on, but I just wanted to highlight how this works. Now, keep in mind, isolated use case. I haven't done this with a physical device, but I can say that this has worked and it's worked well. So at this point, you can see that everything has completely been restored. So what we can do is restart the machine and then it will boot back up and it should boot back up right into Windows, which is exactly what we were looking for. And after a minute or so of booting up and kind of reconfiguring everything, we are good. So this is a bare metal restore of my Windows 10 operating system. So let's talk through a few miscellaneous things. So the first thing that you're gonna notice is that you're gonna see this completed with issues. The reason that it completed with issues, I looked at into exactly why, is because I use syncing tools on some of these Windows devices that use on-demand sync. So ultimately what that means is that the data is not stored on the physical device, it's stored as like a reference on the physical device and if you double click it, it will download it from my NAS. That unfortunately cannot be backed up. So what happens is your backup sees the reference to that file, it tries to back it up, but it can't. So that's why you see this completed with issues. I use that everywhere on all of my Windows devices and unfortunately it can't back those up. That's number one. Number two, if you come in and remove one of these backups, so I'm gonna remove this Docker backup, I'm gonna remove the client. What you'll see is that it's gonna come down here into this section. In order for it to be removed, it has to go through the cleanup process. Inside of the settings and then in the server, you're going to see the cleanup window. 
So for me, this is every single day between 3 and 4 a.m. So at 3 a.m. when this process runs, this client and the backups for this client will be removed. If you didn't want to remove them and you accidentally did it, you just stop removing it. But I don't need to back this up because it's a virtual machine. So I will remove this and then by tomorrow that data will be gone. Next is that there are a ton of pretty granular controls here. So you can set up exactly what the file backups do, exactly what the image backups do, some permissions, client settings. You can modify the settings for individual clients here. So inside of this settings section, while we're not going to really go through a lot of this, there is a lot that you can do to really get very granular with these backups. And finally, I tested this on a very small subset of devices. Granted, all the devices that I plan on backing up, but it's still a very small subset of devices. I searched around and some users did have problems, but it's not always the easiest to determine if those problems are going to be widespread problems or if they're unique to that individual. But keep that in mind. I'm not really saying that this is the absolute perfect backup utility, but overall, this has provided the exact same utility that Synology's Active Backup for Business has provided. It's free, it's open source, it runs very well on TrueNAS, and I really don't have a reason right now to switch back to Active Backup for Business. And that's not to say that Active Backup for Business is not great because it is. And in fact, I'd say I generally prefer the user interface and functionality that Synology Active Backup for Business provides but it always has the limitation that it is on a pre-built NAS device. It is locked down to that device only, and it can't run on anything else. So for me, this is a system that I set up in a few minutes and has been running very well. And I know that I can migrate this to somewhere else, even including my Synology NAS if I ever had to. Can't say that for everything. So I know this was a lot. I'm hopeful that you guys got some value out of this, especially the not only the backups, but the restore. Hopefully I showed enough of that to really highlight exactly how it works, make you feel a little more comfortable. But if you do try it out, let me know in the comments what you think about it. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. I will see you guys next time.